that. Hi, everyone. Um, so welcome to this uh, lecture in the series where uh, I'm going to talk about different properties of stars um, and a little bit about how they're measured um, and, and why they're important. Um, so there's actually quite a few little topics all in here. Um, so you've already seen how a little bit about light, the electromagnetic spectrum, um, how you can uh, get uh, figure out something's certain object's temperature from its thermal spectrum, what it's made of from the emission or absorption line spectra. Um, so we're going to be building on those concepts and looking at stars in general, whereas previously we just looked at our sun as a good example um, because it is the closest star by far. So when you look out at, whoops, when you look out at a star field, um, such as this gorgeous, gorgeous picture with the Hubble Space Telescope, um, you notice a couple things. Um, you notice there are stars of different brightnesses, uh, and that there are stars of different colors. Now the brightness. Oh. This is what I get for recording my lectures during the popular dog walking time. Okay. <laughs> Where was I? Okay. So the brightness that you measure of a star depends on two factors. One is the distance to that star. The other is the, you can say, the intrinsic brightness of the star or its luminosity. So luminosity, um, is how much light a star is actually giving off or, or any object. Um, so, for example, the amount of power is, is how much energy per second. The apparent brightness is how much starlight reaches you. So that's energy per second per square meter um, where you see that the light of the star is spread out over a larger and larger area the further away from the star the light is. Um, so this brings us to, to a particularly important relationship. Um, you can imagine these areas being part of a huge sphere, spheres that are a certain distance from the star. Um, and based on the area of a sphere, you get a relationship that the apparent brightness uh, decreases as the radius squared increases. So what that means is if you are some radius, some arbitrary radius r um, from the star, you see that there's a certain amount of area that the light is spread around, and that determines its apparent brightness for observers at that, at that distance. Twice as far the light is spread out over four times the area. So it appears a fourth of the brightness that it did for the observers at R. Three, three times as far out, now it's spread over, you see, nine times the area. So three squared, nine. Um, so its brightness now is one ninth of what it would have been. So the brightness falls off pretty quickly with distance. So this is um, one thing to keep in mind um, is that when we want to start looking at the actual physical properties of stars, we care about its luminosity. But we can only measure its apparent brightness, so that means we need its distance. First, before I get into that, um, just a note on the magnitude scale. Um, you will often see star brightness quoted in, <clears throat> excuse me, in something called its magnitude. I don't have a whole lot of love for the magnitude system, although it is very popular, popularly used by astronomers, both amateur, professional, and everything in between. Um, if you tell me a star is a magnitude zero, one, two, three, I kind of have an idea of how bright it's going to be in the sky. What you need to remember is that it works in reverse. So a smaller number, or if you look at it on a number line, a more negative number, is a brighter object, the higher the number goes in the positive direction, that's a dimmer object. 
Um, so just want to keep in mind that it, it works backwards. There's a weird historical reason for it, but don't worry about that. Um, so these more negative numbers are super bright. The more positive numbers are um, dimmer. The magnitude scale, uh, it's not linear. Um, it's, it's logarithmic. So uh, a star at magnitude one is, for example, two and a half times brighter than a star of magnitude two. Um, so things, the magnitude scale is going to be, I think you end up with 10 times as bright after five magnitudes. Um, so here, these are the apparent magnitudes, again, the brightness as measured from Earth of these different objects. Um, so the sun, really bright, <laughs> negative 27. The moon, negative 13. Um, the brightest stars you can see are at a negative one. Venus, when it's at its brightest, is even brighter than that. Um, if you are at a site with very little light pollution, you can see down to magnitude six. That's the, the, the dimmest you can see. Um, but then you add binoculars, you add telescopes, um, you can see to fainter and fainter or higher and higher magnitudes. Now, the apparent magnitude is what you measure. The absolute magnitude is used in um, comparing different objects to each other. So the absolute magnitude asks or tells you uh, what would the apparent magnitude of this object be at a specific distance. So the calculation moves the object to a specific distance that all objects are at the same distance when you compare them. Um, so absolute magnitude is what magnitude would it appear to be if it was 10 parsecs away? That's the specific distance. So, for example, um, the sun is way mega bright uh, to us because it's super close. Um, so its apparent magnitude is super, super bright. We'll say bright, super negative, super bright. But it's not actually that bright of a star in comparison to many other stars. Um, if it was at 10 parsecs, it would have a magnitude of five. So it would be I would not be able to see it naked eye from from Manchester, New Hampshire, for example. Um, if you look at a star, so these other stars, um, so uh, Canopus is a particular brightness, um, apparent magnitude, which is negative one, it's pretty bright, but its absolute magnitude is even brighter, negative three. So that means it's further than 10 parsecs out. If you brought it to 10 parsecs, it would appear to be negative three. Um, there's a couple more examples there. I don't want to spend too much time on this because um, I will not be using a lot of that in the activities if you're taking this course. But if you are observing, um, you are going to hear a lot about magnitudes. OK, I mentioned a distance. Uh, in, that was 10 parsecs. Parsec is a unit of distance. The word comes from uh, like a mishmash of two words, parallax and arc second. And so we're going to talk about what those two things are. Um, so parsec is a measure of distance, despite what Han Solo tells you. Um, and arc second is a measure of angle. So when we look at the... Um, uh, we look at objects on the sky. You can't really look up at two stars and say, well, star one is two inches away from star two because, like, where do you hold the ruler, right? So we use angles um, to, to measure how far away things are apart from each other in the sky or how big they are in the sky. Um, one degree, for example, is the width. Where's my camera? The width of your index finger at arm's length, roughly. This works. Roughly, because if you have tiny hands, you probably have short arms, as I do. Um, if you are a taller person, you might have thicker fingers, but your arms longer, so it's further away. So it still works out to about a degree. So the width of your finger is one degree. Um, the full moon is half of that, half a degree or 30 arc minutes. Doesn't seem like it. Totally try it. You will see you can cover the moon twice with your index finger. Um, so one degree is about that. You divide one degree into 60 parts. Each one of those is an arc minute. So super, super tiny. Um, you take an arc minute, divide that into 60 parts. You get really, really, really tiny. 
that's an arc second. That's the scale of um, motion in the sky that we're going to be talking about. Um, so, oh, it, in this example, say in a soccer ball at 45 kilometers or 28 miles, I can't, I can't imagine what that is. Just go with the finger for the one degree. Okay, so parallax um, is a method of measuring distance using geometry. So, again, if you want to put your finger out, it's kind of hard to do this webcam wise, but uh, if you put your finger out and close one eye, do this with me, and you position your finger so it's covering something that's in the background for you. So for me, it's covering a particular icon on my screen. Now, if you switch which eye is open, which is closed, what you'll notice is that the finger appears to shift, now uncovering whatever thing it was that you were covering before that was further away. So that is a demonstration of parallax. The thing that is closer, um, as you move or, or as your, your point of view moves back and forth this way, the thing you're looking at appears to move in front of whatever's in the background. Um, so this diagram is showing that here's your one eye open, seeing your object against the background, say there's a French flag behind you. Um, and then here's your other eye you have uh, looking at that same object it would look like viewpoint B. So viewpoint A, viewpoint B. Um, this works with stars because the Earth is already in the sun, as we learned from our uh, heliocentrism chapter. Um, so if you look at a star that is nearby and you compare it to much, much further away stars, um, so basically the further away something goes, the less of this effect there is to the point where it eventually becomes impossible to measure with our current technology. So you have stars that are far enough away that they don't seem to move um, as the Earth goes from one side of the sun to the other. So one observation here, six months later there. Um, but that nearby star will appear to move against that background of the fixed stars. Um, so using this example, the red, white, and blue squares are like the background stars and the yellow star is like the close star. And so every six months, you would see it, you know, over the course of six months, you would see it move back and forth. So that little angle or half that angle that it moves is called the parallax angle. So we measure the parallax in parsecs. No, I take that back. We measure the parallax in arc seconds. So that's a measure of angle. And the distance to a star that has a parallax of one arc second is a parsec. So a parsec, the unit of distance, is defined by the geometry of the Earth going around the sun um, and, you know, a particular standard measurement. So if you know, for example, so if you measure a change of two parsecs, then you put the two in for that P, you get one half, the distance is half. Sorry, I said parsecs, didn't I? <laughs> if your parallax is two arc seconds, you put that in for P, you get D equals one over two. That's half a parsec away. The smaller the angle, so say you measure half a parsec, one over one half is two, that means the distance is two parsecs away. You're more likely to hear light years when uh, reading about astronomy stories because it's a little bit, it's obviously a little bit more to explain what a parsec is, whereas a light year is the distance light travels in one year, it's a little easier to get across. Um, but that relationship is a, is a factor of about three. So um, if you ever wanna figure that out in your head, you can do that. Okay, so parallax is one of our primary ways of measuring distance to nearby stars. Later in the course, we're going to talk about different ways of measuring um, the distance. And actually, I think in this section, um, if you're taking the course, um, you'll we'll talk a little bit about variable stars, um, which are one way. But parallax is kind of that the first, the first, um, yeah, I could say first rung in the distance ladder. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so getting the distance very important because. 
when you know the distance and you measure the apparent brightness, that gives you the luminosity, how much light the star is actually giving off. Now you can get the physics of the star. One of the other things we saw in that picture was that the stars um, had different colors. And again, if you think back to the um, thermal spectra that we talked about, the bluer an object is, the hotter it is, the redder it is, the cooler it is. So stars tend to fall, you know, in this, you know, few thousand Kelvin to 10,000, you know, three to 10,000 Kelvin, say, um, where the cooler ones are going to appear red and the middle-ish ones are going to be like white and then the, the, cool, the hottest ones are going to be blue. Um, so that's just looking at the star spectrum to figure out its rough temperature. Now, we also want to use the spectrum to figure out what the star is made of. So, again, going back to that lesson about spectra and light, um, if you have a particular atom with two energy levels for the electron, it's going to absorb a certain specific wavelength or certain specific energy of light to go from one level to the other. So that means when the light of a thermal spectrum, a continuous spectrum, goes through that gas full of that atom, that gas made up of that type of atom, how about that, um, it's going to be missing certain wavelengths of light. So this is an example of a hydrogen spectrum. This is what hydrogen would look like in absorption. <clears throat> and again, each element has its own unique fingerprint. Um, these are French, I believe. Uh, so this is showing you hydrogen, helium, oxygen, sodium, and mercury. Um, what the absorption spectra of those look like. If you did the activity just um, earlier for um, spectra, you probably looked at a lot of emission spectra. Um, emission and absorption spectra, the lines will happen at the same wavelength for that particular type. Absorption spectra happens to be uh, what we see when we look at stars. Um, Stars, uh, the stellar spectrum is dominated by the thermal spectrum of the, the compressed inner layers. And that light is going through the atmosphere of the star, which is cooler than the inner layers. So it gives you an absorption spectrum. Um, so you can look at a star's, you can look at a star's spectrum, look at all of the dark lines there are, and match those up with the different patterns from the different atoms. That will give you an idea of what's in that star. Um, so for the example that I've shown in, in other slides, um, the solar spectrum stretched way out. You couldn't get it across the screen, so they make, you know, cut it down to different rows. Um, all of those dark, all of those dark lines are um, from atoms. Hold on. I don't know if the microphone was picking up the dog wrestling, but it was driving me. Anyway, um, okay, so I talked about these lines. Now, last time we looked at light, um, I showed you that this rainbow spectrum can be kind of turned sideways so that you can measure the brightness of every wavelength. That's what you're actually going to see when you look at the spectrum of a star. You're not usually going to see it presented as this cute rainbow. You're going to see um, just a line plot of how much light there is at each of those wavelengths. So this is showing for a whole bunch of different stars, hottest at the top, coolest at the bottom, um, in order from hottest to coolest, uh, with the, you got the purple short wavelengths on the left side and the long wavelength red on the right side. So a couple things to notice. One thing is for the hottest stars, notice there's more shorter wavelength light than longer wavelength light. That's capturing a part of that thermal spectrum curve, showing you that um, a hot object is going to have a peak uh, all the way over these short wavelengths. It's going to look blue because there's more blue light than other types of light. Um, just note the uh, the actual the, uh, these aren't ordered by brightness. They're just kind of spaced out for for you to look at. So don't worry too much about the um, y axis. OK, you go down from that. You start to go down, you notice um, that peak gets lower. It's a little weird because of some effects I don't want to quite get into right now, but you can see it best at the bottom with the coolest star that it's now ramping up further um, 
to the right, longer wavelength, redder, and off the chart in the infrared. Um, so that, again, matches our thermal spectrum for a cooler object where its peak is going to be all the way over in the longer wavelengths. It's going to give off more red light than blue light, so it's going to look red. Okay, so you can see that shape. That gives you part of what you're looking for in a star. Um, you're also going to see those absorption lines or those dips. Those black lines are going to show up as dips. Um, and one thing to notice is that some of these stars have certain lines, some have other lines. Um, you may want to immediately attach that to saying some stars have some elements and other stars don't. It's not always the case. There's a little bit of a complication here. Um, what, what absorption lines a type of atom shows also depends on its environment, on the temperature of its environment. Um, so you're going to get, you're not going to see a lot of hydrogen lines in a really hot star. They're going to be really small, but the hydrogen is still there. Most of the star is hydrogen. Um, in the, the middling, um, high to middling temperatures, you see some really sharp lines due to hydrogen. Um, those fade away again as you get to cooler stars. Doesn't mean there's no hydrogen, just means it's at a lower temperature. Um, and so uh, those transitions aren't happening as often. Um, so you've got two things that you get from that spectrum. You, you get a, also get a handle on the temperature, um, but you get the composition um, as well. Okay, spectral lines can tell you something else about the star, something that's not necessarily intrinsic to the star, but how it's moving. Um, so the, the lines can actually show up at not the right wavelengths. So on the top is showing, um, yeah, let's say the top is the, the spectrum of, say, you know, some gas, some mix of gases in the lab or, you know, what those wavelengths would be. Um, for that certain mix of gases. And then the one on the bottom is what you actually measure for a star. And you notice the pattern's right, but it's it's at the wrong wavelengths. It's either shifted one way. In this case, it's shifted towards the red. So this red shift is a uh, due to the fact that um, the object is moving away from you. I think in the, in the light section that you... Um, if you go back to those, I did show some little cute animations of, you know, why sort of why this happens. This red shift when something moves away and this blue shift when it moves towards. Um, so that's really important in stellar spectrum spectra for figuring out their motions. And for example, certain binary star systems are seen that way. Binary stars are stars that are uh, close to each other, orbiting each other. Um, sometimes they're orbiting so closely and they're so far away. It looks like one star to our telescope. But if you look at the spectrum, you'll notice these lines going back and forth, red shifting and blue shifting. That's showing you that um, the star is sometimes moving towards you, sometimes moving away from you. Or one star or the other is moving towards you, away from you, towards you, away from you. Um, that also happens to be the way that some planets are detected um, around other stars, which we're not super going to get into in this one. Um, so those are for certain types of binary stars. Um, you can see it in their spectra that they're binary. Other types of binary stars, you can see it just by looking at their brightness and how it changes over time. Um, I'm not going to get too much into detail of this for, for binary stars, um, but when the, the cooler star is in front of a hotter star, you get a big dip. Uh, and when the cooler star is behind the hotter star, you get a small dip. So you can figure out from, you know, measuring the brightness of that one point of light in your image change that it's actually two stars orbiting each other. And finally, of course, um, certain binaries can actually be seen over time um, with one star orbiting another. Um, and sometimes those time scales are really, really long. Um, some of our some of our students at St. Anselm are uh, involved in a project where they are imaging the precise positions of these um, these double stars to determine are they really just like two stars that appear to be close together because they're close together in the sky or are they actually moving around each other 
And you sometimes need to look at it over decades or even centuries to detect the motion. Um, so we're, they're adding new observations and comparing observations taken, although I think they go back to like the 1700s. Um, binary stars, uh, not just a cool, neat thing. They're actually also important for telling us about stellar properties. You remember Kepler's third law. Um, the more distant planets orbit the sun at a an average slower a slower speed, and it gives you this relationship between the period, how long it takes to go around, and the size of the orbit. Um, a specific mathematical relationship. We did this in year the period in years and the dis average distance from the sun in astronomical units. That works out nicely, um, particularly in our solar system, and Newton found that this is generalizable and pretty universal everywhere. However, the um, you do have to look at a little more complicated factors. Um, so for uh, for say two star two two stars in a binary system, you have to include the masses of those two stars. So the way this was worked out, years, astronomical units, and the mass of the sun, it all works nicely. Um, if you want to use it for something other than planets going around our sun, you have to use a more general formula. Um, you still have the period. You still have the um, distance from average distance from the center object or between the centers of the objects. Um, you have this gravitational constant, which I'm not going to get into, but it's a fundamental universal constant about how strong gravity is um, and the masses of those stars and some geometric factors there. What this means is you can measure that period um, and you can actually determine uh, that and um, that can help you determine the masses of stars. So it's really, 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 really hard to get the mass of a star just chilling by itself when um, something's orbiting that star or if two stars are orbiting each other. That gravitational interaction gives us information about the mass. A lot of highlights. This is pretty dense. Um, distance of the star is a key factor in determining the physical characteristics because brightness that we measure is nice, but we really want to know the luminosity, how much light it actually gives off. Parallax is a great geometric method of determining the distance to stars. Um, what we'll see later is that it only works for, you know, stars fairly close to us in the Milky Way. Um, you can look at a star's spectra, uh, color gives you an estimate of the temperature. Um, something I glossed right over in one of the images is that um, if you know the luminosity and the temperature, that gives you an idea of the radius. And I glossed over that, but this is what it was showing in this. Um, it was showing the, the sizes, the, the relative sizes or radii of these stars. Um, that's not something you can measure easily with a telescope either. Um, but knowing its luminosity and its temperature, you, you can actually figure that out, um, from those measurements. Okay. Luminosity, temperature give you radius. Huh. Temperature, composition, and to a certain extent, the mass can be determined by stellar spectra. I didn't talk much about the mass. If you're reading along, um, in the textbook for this course, it is mentioned, so I, I stuck it in there. Um, but the temperature and composition are, are the things that you really get from that spectrum. Um, and then I copied that. That's awesome. <laughs> get rid of that. Um, spectra also give you information about the motions of stars with those red shifts and blue shifts. And finally, the masses of the stars are best measured um, from gravitational interactions such as binary star systems. Okay, a lot of stuff. Um, hope you're following along okay from the videos. Um, and if you're in the course, definitely reference the textbook while, you, while you're, um, looking at this. Um, since the textbook section, textbook has a mini section on each of those. All right. I'll see you for the next one.